All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Ansala here. I'm a professor of government here at Harvard University, and I direct the Center for American Political Studies. Um, welcome to the first of what we plan to be many uh, meetings on political analytics here at Harvard. This conference is sponsored by the Harvard Center on American, Political, uh, on American Politics and by Microsoft, and we're grateful to Dritan Nesho and the Microsoft Pulse um, uh, group for their support. Today's conference is really the brainchild of two people, Kirk Goldsberry and Ryan Enos, and I just want to give them a big round of applause. Um, Uh, Kirk has had one of the more unusual academic careers from my perspective. He, he was an assistant professor of geography at Michigan State, visited here at Harvard for a couple of years, and now somehow ends up as the data analyst for uh, the San Antonio Spurs. So I'm actually extremely jealous of Kirk, um, uh, both for his jump shot and for his job. Uh, and Ryan is an associate professor here in the government department. And uh, the two of them started this collaboration a few years ago. They had this idea, and uh, after a lot of persistence, they've helped pull together which I, what I think is an absolutely fabulous group. Um, today's conference was also organized by Laura Donaldson, who's the manager of CAPS up in the gray dress. Thank you very much, Laura, for all your hard work and persistence. And a number of other people have helped bring off today's meeting. I want to uh, recognize Alex Abrams, Alex, or Alex, uh, uh, sorry, Alex down here, and Spencer Ma. So Spencer and Alex, thank you very much. There are two undergraduates here in the college and have worked as interns to just get everything running. There are also a few other people around who are to help make the day go better. If you have questions, uh, you know, where's the bathroom, how do I get to... Uh, some building. Uh, Liz Salazar, Jeronica Fuller, Stephen Pettigrew, and Shannon McGregor are available to help you throughout the day. Finally, in conjunction, in conjunction with this meeting and with other CAPS um, events and activities, we've uh, started an initiative of doing art installations in conjunction with any kind of um, public event. And uh, um, thanks to Laura Donaldson's help in organizing and, and installing, uh, this uh, newest art installation. We have an excellent uh, installation called Campaign Limericks. Uh, on the, it's on the fourth floor of CGIS Canoffel, which is the opposite building to this one. Um, and you're all welcome to head across the street at some point and check these out. They're hilarious. Um, and they're the product of artist Catherine Dignazio, who's an assistant professor of civic media and data visualization at Emerson College and the director of the Institute for Infinitely Small Things, which is an artist collective here in Boston. Uh, and the idea is she took text, like you just saw, and measured how frequently the text was mentioned by the campaigns, used that for sizing, and then remixed the text to come up with um, some very creative, very clever limericks to describe um, the candidates and the campaigns uh, in their own words, but not as they were spoken. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Kirk and Ryan to kick things off. Thank you. As Steve said, I'm Ryan Enos, and I'm a political scientist here at Harvard. Um, I have the, the first duty of just giving a few more logistical details, um, which is the, one of the first of which is that we will have more coffee at some point. Um, <laughs> the second of which is that lunch will be served out in the concourse in boxes. Um, the third of which is that there will be reception following the lightning talk, so we encourage you all to stick around for that. During panels, uh, at the moderator's discretion, there will be a chance for people in the audience to ask questions, and at that point, please wait for one of the microphones that comes down from um, one of our helpers, because this event is being uh, audio and video recorded. Um, that being said, before I turn things over to Kirk, uh, I just wanted to say that um, somebody told me once that I should be grateful for Nate Silver, because he made political science cool. Um, I, I kind of thought it had always been cool, um, but, but what Nate and some other people in this room have done is they've brought the power of political analytics to the masses, and other people in this room have actually taken that and used it to actually win campaigns. Um, and in a certain respect, that's the way it should be, because you know, we all do think politics is cool, but it's also vitally important. It shapes people's lives, and so we should have the best minds and the best tools at work to try to, um, to, try to help us analyze it. Um, and especially in a time like this, when um, we sort of our, our underlying assumptions are being questioned, we really need to bring those tools to bear. Um, so when Kurt came to me and said that uh, he had this idea for this conference, I said, 
that's a great idea, and we should make it happen. And um, we're really glad you're all here. And with that, I'll turn it over to my co-creator, Kirk Goldsberry. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Um, I'm going to segue into our first panel. But first, if you're going to tweet about this, we have this hashtag. <laughs> the world's longest hashtag. But <laughs> that could be your entire tweet. But uh, please tweet about this. That's another thing, especially Nate and others who have a lot of followers. But. Uh, I stole this idea. I go to the Sloan Conference at MIT every year, and I speak there. It's a fantastic conference at MIT that brings together media, professional sports teams, um, students, academics. And uh, I said, why is sports analytics ahead of political analytics? That's, that's stupid, but it's true in some, some, some way. Maybe not all the time, but in some of the time. Um, so I, my vision was, why don't we have the Sloan Conference for Politics, essentially, at Harvard? And that was all I brought to this event. And then Ryan and Stephen made it happen. Uh, so thank you guys so much for making this happen. Uh, and, and like Stephen said, we're trying to do this every year. Uh, here, we'll, we'll grow the room, we promise, next year. We're blown away by the demand and the people who participated. We want to thank them. Um, and what are political analytics? That's a good question. As a geography professor, when I think of the reasoning artifacts that help me understand the political landscape, I'm driven to think about maps. I think about maps a lot. My whole career is based around maps and storytelling and spatial analysis. Uh, and so our first panel today, I'm very excited to have three of my favorite map makers from the media world here, visionaries that sort of help us understand the political landscape, predict what's going to happen, and explain what has happened. Um, in exciting ways. So you guys can take your seats. I'll introduce you as you do so. This is Carl Good. Oh, yeah. I'm taking uh, my seat. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have Andre Shankman from 538. Carl's from Michigan State, formerly of Newsweek. And then we have Amanda Cox from the New York Times. Can we just give them a, a, a happy welcome? And so I do think Think about this. The very idea of red states and blue states, which dominate American political discourse, derives from a Korpluff map. Right? The red state, blue state map has, it's the number one political artifact in the United States right now. Uh, but it's not that old. And in fact, in 1984, when uh, Reagan beat Mondale 49 to 1, is that right? 49 states to 1. And George Orwell took over the world. <laughs> That's right. Uh, David Brinkley on, I think, ABC was quoted as saying, Reagan's victory colors the United States as blue as a California swimming pool because they were using blue for Republicans and red for Democrats as late as 1984. Yeah. So this is a relatively recent phenomenon, the red state, blue state thing that is so ingrained and entrenched. Um, and the first person I really want to have talk about mapping the electorate is Carl Good because he's seen this thing from the, the Mondale year uh, Way through before that. the Obama year uh, with roles at the UPI, AP, Newsweek, and now at Michigan State University where he teaches journalism. He's seen the whole arc in a way that very few people have. And so you've prepared a few slides. Yeah, you I did. I'm gonna, I have to stand up when I talk. So yeah. Um, the, yeah, that's me. They actually use me as a model for that. The, uh, so. I, I'm actually a, an artist, a cartoonist, an illustrator, and I came to New York to be a, one of those, and I wound up as a journalist instead, and uh, just the power of saying yes when you really want to say no, and it changed my career. But uh, I worked uh, at UPI. UPI, there's these things called news agencies. AP is another one, Reuters, Agence France Presse. They provide news to the smaller entities, not the New York Times, but the smaller newspapers and news organizations that don't have their own departments. So we had 1,600 newspapers on our, on our network and uh, I was the graphics director. Um, and uh, this was my office. It was a, actually a color world. It wasn't black and white like this. <laughs> and uh, that's my friend Pete on the left. And uh, my desk was right under those photos. And those are Unifax machines that were old, old technologies, that, like fax machines that received photography, that recreated photos that were transmitted. Uh, every newspaper, uh, 1,600 of them had those, and they received our products on those things, including on my maps and stuff. So, and that's me on the other side of that wall, um, under those photos, you see, working at my desk in 1979. Uh, I just started, and I was just about to cover the Reagan election. I didn't even know what the hell that meant. Um, 
I was a cartoonist, you know. So, uh, you know, my cigarettes, my rapidographs, my airbrush lines. Airbrush uh, is just like Photoshop, except it uses paint. <laughs> and, and it was like, I was, uh, I was the victim of every reporter, every photo editor that walked in, and they'd walk in and they'd go, we want a map and we want a chart and we'll take fries with that. And, uh, you know, these, we just was service, totally service department. And I got really, really tired of being, having to put Carter's head on a lame duck body with a crutch and move that out uh, to the news, newsrooms. You know, that, when I did that, it, said, uh, it raised howls of derisive laughter around our newsroom when they got that cartoon. And, but the, the, but the, the elections were coming. And this was the base maps that they were, they were already existing. They'd used those for forever. Um, and they were, they were built really fat and horsey with thick lines and huge patterns that you cut out with an X-Acto knife and you glued, you stuck them on. We used press type for all the type. I've written entire paragraphs with press type, one letter at a time, you know, lined up blue lines. On deadline, on election night. And, uh, and, and you can see that the, the Hawaii and Alaska has cutouts. We'd glue that on there and then we'd photograph it. And uh, we would transmit, transmit the results uh, on election night. We had tons of different things, polls. Um, exit poll materials, state-by-state uh, state county maps. It was a lot of work. You get a print, you'd wrap it around one of these drums and, uh, at the news agency, and it would rotate around, and a little light would follow the, the photo, our, our graphic, and uh, convert it to pulses. And, and uh, those machines I showed you on the, you know, the Univax machines would, would interpret those as you know, long pulses as black and no pulse as white and all the ranges in between. I once retouched a photo of Nancy Reagan. I put makeup on her, like black, you know, black eyebrows, like real, not good, lipstick, and gave it to a photo editor as a joke. And uh, I found that thing transmitting to 1,600 newspapers. I said, don't you look at this shit? I mean, come on. <laughs> I can't believe it. I ripped it off the drum myself. Um, that's why we're called a wire service, because all, all of the material went through the wires. When they come out, and, but the problem was that the stuff was really ugly on the other end. It was all blurry, and that's why everything was so big to survive this photo transmission technology, because it wasn't for black and white. It just was horrible. Newspapers hated it. We hated it. Then they got the Unifax too. I thought it, things were going to be great, just as bad. It really didn't work for graphics at all. It was just awful stuff. But it was all the newspapers had. It was all we could give them. But for the 84 election, I decided to change the maps. And, but I still had to use those big horsey patterns and cut out around every state and label and all these kind of things and have really big horsey type in order to survive the transmission. And uh, we, still, you know, we still did a lot. But I was starting to understand how to cover elections by the 84 elections. Um, then one day, I called Apple Computer and asked them if I could have some, uh, this new thing called an Apple Lisa. And they gave us two of those, and they sent some executives out, and including Susan Kerr, who designed all of these things, the packaging, the, the, the colors of the boxes. She was the first designer for Apple. And I got this instant crush on Susan Kerr. You can all Google her, and I still have it. You know, for those of you who remember the bomb, uh, the, those are the days, right? This is still like rock star images for those of us who are older. Um, but, but around this time, the problem was we were still printing it out on a CompuGraphic typesetter this beautiful, crisp-looking map. I remember making a map, and, but then we'd take it off the typesetter, wrap it around the photo drum, and transmit it, this blurry piece of junk out to all the newspapers. It was like so frustrating. So anyway, that's when I left. And about a year later, I wound up at the Associated Press as their graphics director. And, uh, and it was back to the drawing table. It was just, oh, great. So um, about within a year, we had all those draw drawing tables were lined up down the hallway to be going, sent out to warehouses. And I put a Mac on everybody's desk. And I, I'd given them six months to learn it. We had trainers come in, a little Mac Plus. And, uh, and everybody except the older people who, now that I look back, were actually younger than I am now. Um, they refused to learn it. It was really awkward and uncomfortable to be a 26-year-old guy about to fire a 50-year-old. But I didn't fire anybody. But everybody thought it was really awesome. So you know that the, the thing is, the wire services, if we could adopt the Mac, Macintosh platform, and then if we got it, then all of the newspaper industry would get it too. They'd all buy these things. And so they were really excited. Apple sent people. That's an Apple ad that I appeared in. Uh, this is an AP ad. The caption that you can't see actually says, Carl Goode, master of the Macintosh, which was, I still have a friend who calls me and says, can I speak to the master of the Macintosh? I'm like so not the master of the Macintosh anymore, these folks are. Um, uh, so in, in 1988, I actually 
went from New York with my backpack with a, my Mac Plus or SE in it and headed down to the Bureau in Washington and covered the elections from there. You can see there's a little Capitol building on that Mac. And uh, um, that guy up there is the guy who lent me the shirt and tie for, for that image. Um, I actually married the woman who, shot, who arranged that photo shoot, the corporate communications person. We've been married for 28 years now. I met her that day. She said, you need a tie. Brian, give him your tie. And that's Brian. <laughs> and uh, so no, we did a lot of great stuff. And what was great about these graphics that we produced on the Mac using a transmitting with a 1200 baud modem, if you remember those things, um, newspapers could finally go log into a database and download these things and edit them for the first time. They could, they could change colors and fonts and repackage them. They could, the first thing they did was delete that AP logo every time. It was so annoying. Uh, but, it, but, for, and, but we were, and we were also able to produce, we produced really great interactive base maps for every state. So every state got their county map. So on election night, they get update all of those different counties as the results came in. We couldn't do it for them, but we could provide them. Then we got this thing called GraphicsNet, which actually we designed, which was a Mac-to-Mac -Mac satellite transmission of graphics. So it would literally, we'd, we would send them up to a satellite and they would just land in, in computers all across America and just print out automatically on laser writers, which newspapers loved, you know. Um, I'm speaking lightly fast, so I'm getting winded. So anyway, I left AP, and I went to Newsweek, and I, I became the director of graphics at Newsweek, and I, I covered um, three presidential elections for Newsweek. Uh, we had a pretty nice staff there, and, you know, and that's when mapping really grew up. We got into data-driven graphics and that sort of thing. Um, this was designed by Bonnie Scranton, who's a Tufty, uh, a Tufty person. She helped design his books, for instance. And uh, we wa some of us wanted to go to work and do stuff for the web, but we were told that we were told that the magazine came first, and if you wanted to do anything for the web, you could do that on your own time. So it was like that was not a good mentality to have for Newsweek, which kind of went out of business. <laughs> I mean, after we went home, we could work on the internet stuff at home. And now I'm a professor. I'm, using, I'm teaching infographics and stuff at, for two students at our great school of journalism there. And we have, uh, we're going to have the world's, the Michigan's biggest newsroom with 100 students on election night. And my students are producing videos right now, 12 animated videos explaining the political process for different aspects of the political process. So um, that's where we are. This was made by one of my students. Um, Malia Eggleton, so she's awesome. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay. Oh, that was great. Thank you. That was, I guess that's up to speed. That yeah. Carl doesn't really know how panels work, but now I'm <laughs> great. We asked, I asked Carl to do that. I asked, I asked him to do that. Well, I thought it was we were supposed to talk. Yeah. <laughs> The other, the other people aren't going to do that. We're going to have a conversation. <laughs> Carl's obviously great at talking about uh, how we arrived here in 2016 as mapping politics people. Uh, and the people uh, he shares the stage with are two of sort of the leaders in the realm right now. Um, one of the things you touched on that I think is really interesting is how the medium is obviously <laughs> always a character in this. Yeah. situation. And there were no red states and blue states in the 1930s because newspapers didn't have red and blue ink, essentially. Yeah. And so now the bottleneck for a long time was the computation, um, and then it was the media, and now we have no such bottlenecks. And now we're really just really experimenting, and, and our minds can go wild. And I want to talk about how that is affecting what is happening at 538 in the New York Times. So. Let's start with Amanda Cox, who is really, she should win a Pulitzer Prize if she hasn't already. You haven't won a Pulitzer yet, Amanda, right? No. You should, Never you should. even that. Is anybody in this room who's in charge of the Pulitzer Prize? Uh, let's show one of Amanda's uh, maps. I think she wants to show, you want to do the mayoral election you did? I, we yeah, can, we'll we start. can start there. So there are lots of people who make maps at the New York Times, almost uh, all of whom are not myself. Uh, but I asked many of them what their their favorite New York Times election map was. And far and away, the like number one uh, candidate in this mini survey was this. Uh, no way. Can we switch to Democrats? Yeah. 
that one, uh, a much nicer map, uh, a 2013 map of uh, precinct re election results in, in New York City. Uh, and watching Carl's presentation from his first map to his last map, it fills me with hope that in my lifetime, uh, we will have live precinct maps like across my the country. My life's not over. Right? In, in your lifetime too, right? Like yeah. I, think, I, think, I think they're... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so the reason uh, I think the Times Graphics Department likes this map uh, is in part because of the resolution, but also it's one of the examples where we get the filters right. So if you click on uh, average income over on the right, and then there's a slider up in the top left, and so you know you can if you move that far enough to the right. On the other way, you can see like how rich would we really have to be for like Christine Quinn, you know, if only the super richest <laughs> districts could, you know, and so if, if only people who lived in neighborhoods that were like above $175,000 or more, uh, we would have a different mayor. But another reason that the, the Times uh, Graphics Department enjoys this map uh, is because of the next slide. Uh, and this, is, this isn't us, this is just someone reacting on Twitter. So several months, a few months after the mayoral election, there was a snowstorm in New York City. Uh, it was winter, it dumped about a foot of snow. Uh, and the inset there on the left is uh, where the snow plows had gone, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, Christine Quinn lost, the, she won all the, the richest neighborhoods in New York, which were the, those yellow parts, uh, and those were the parts that were not being uh, plowed during snowstorm. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not enough of a, of a conspiracy theorist to really believe that this, this actually means anything. This is, you know, just people on Twitter at 3 a.m. in a snowstorm. Uh, but I do believe that's the, that's the real strength of maps, uh, is that they reveal, reveal patterns. Uh, and so I brought one more example of that. Uh, if you go actually ahead to one, one, that one, yeah. So this is our classic chloroplast, right? I think this is from 2008. Uh, you all know this, uh, red, blue. Uh, after we made this map in 2008 and we'd done the same like kind of filter tricks that were on the mayor and you could like click around and filter by like Tea Party people and Catholics and whatever else you wanted, which is fine and really good. But my favorite version of it uh, is really professors reacting on their, their, to, by themselves on the internet. So in the next slide, there's a professor of biology in uh, Missouri, I think, who said like, oh, that the crescent shape that we see all the time in South elections, uh, that reminds me of a different map. It reminds me of a map of where uh, cotton farms were in the 1860s. Uh, and then the next slide, someone else on the internet says like, oh, I'll help you, I'll put them together. And you can kind of see, you know, that's sort of the same pattern. And then the next slide, Another professor uh, on the internet says, oh, but you know why that is, right? It's because, you know, 85 million years ago, the sea covered that part of the land. And so <laughs> when, you know, when the sea recedes, uh, the sea creatures, their dead bodies, they make the soil fertile. It makes it conducive to cotton farming. Cotton farming is associated with slavery. That changes the demographics, you know, 160 years later. And so the thing about maps is that you blow all of your most important visual dimensions on the where. And so my favorite maps are always end up being about the why, right? Like in the part of the reason I think the standard chloroplast map is cool is because embedded within it is like 85 million years of history that you can see like you know every time you see the standard and so that's what I think really are about the power of maps it's about both revealing patterns and reminding us of our history of why the why the patterns look that way yeah the, the chloroplast map has its has like an Olympic cycle. It's very relevant every four years, and uh, but it is it is ramping up. So choroplath, as I always tell my students, plethos, choros, places and values, and that's essentially mapping the places and values of the American people. It's, that cotton one is incredible. Thank you for showing. I'd never seen that. Um, so another thing that I thought was incredible that appeared on 538, if we can transition to Andre, is. Uh, a choropleth map that could only have been made very recently, which let's do the, the Facebook primary. Is that so Andre, I guess could you just briefly summarize your role at five thirty eight and uh and, and, and how you're sort of seeing projects like this through first? Yeah, so I oversee the graphics department at five thirty eight and graphics at five thirty eight it's a pretty um, broad use of that term in that we think about how to present things, how they should look, but we're also building the systems. And you know, the eight-person staff is all comprised of people who mix 
skills in computer programming, uh, experience in journalism, and experience in mapping and information design. So this project, again, very contemporary, uh, could not have happened in this week, right? Definitely. So can you walk us through a project like, or, or this, this specific project, Andre? What, how did this come about? Sure, so, you know, like Amanda showed, there's a lot of great election maps around election result data, around demographic data. Um, we were interested in trying to figure out if we could do some mapping projects around other aspects of the election. And you know, the, one of the first things that came up when we were talking about it is what's going on um, in social media and on the internet in terms of support for candidates. And, and are there ways we can try to understand that aspect of the campaign? Um, and so we went and we talked to the data science team at Facebook. Um, and started trying to figure out what they would be comfortable giving us in terms of data about likes. Obviously, they had a lot of concerns about privacy and about anonymization. Um, but we ended up kind of working closely with them to extract the data set of detailed um, geocoded like data for all the pages of the major presidential candidates. Um, and then we just started mapping it. And we you know, started with just doing using kind of tools to generate static maps to try to understand what was in there, what were the patterns, what was interesting. Um, and as we did it, you know, we found there was some interesting stuff at the top level um, and you know, some things you could expect. If you turn on Cruz, you'll see his support in Texas. If you turn on Kasich, you know, you'll see his support in his home state. Um, but the most interesting stuff, as we started using it, seemed to be at the really local level. So, when you click on one of the states, you know, Kirk, you could click on Texas. Yeah. Um, and then you could click over on Austin. And the thing that seemed the most interesting, more than the kind of nationwide patterns, was this local data. We were all interested in looking at our hometowns and the neighborhoods and kind of seeing at a really granular level um, what was going on in terms of this aspect of the election. Um, so we ended up building a map kind of based around this idea of making it really easy for people to zoom in and, and, and look really closely at what was happening. At, in this case, it's the ZCTA level, so these zip code equivalents constructed from um, the census districts. And uh, so this was an example of a map where I think the, the map kind of serves two functions. There was like the map as the visualization, the national thing, but the, the bigger thing here I think that ended up being more successful was the map as an interface to let you drill down into the data you're most interested in and just as a way to, to bring people into something. Um, that's like a paradigm shift. Like when Carl was first doing this, you kind of knew the story. There was 50 states and 16 voted this way and 34 voted that way and you're just showing people that. One of the things that Amanda and Andre are dealing with now is that. you don't know all the stories in here as Amanda illustrated. Somebody on some, you, you, that's kind of terrifying to know that you're publishing things that you don't know some of this. How could you possibly know about Austin's political leanings in San Antonio when you're in New York? And it's crazy. So I love that anecdote with the cotton farms is a great example of how people, you're empowering people to tell their own stories with these. And that, that is a big paradigm shift. But one of the things I think the Times has balanced really well and 538 as well is yeah, you can give these people the choose your own adventure thing, but you still have to tell the story. Like, the, I remember the day after the Obama election of 2012, you guys, I think, ran on the front page the wind metaphor map, which I, can you talk, were you involved with that project? I was, yeah. That was beautiful, right? So it's just a picture of the United States, not a typical red state, blue state map. Can you describe it? Sure, so one of the things we always struggle with is uh, showing change in a map. And the standard approach, right, is you just color it according to, uh, you know, you color it according to shift. So the blue counties are the ones that became more democratic, even if they're still like very, very Republican counties. Uh, and there's something that's like intuitively dissatisfying about this. Uh, and so inspired by some work that people were doing about actually mapping real wind, like not you know, not, not a metaphor, they were actually mapping wind patterns. Uh, we just decided to show, you know, moving arrows essentially across the, across the country uh, about how it shifted. And so, it, you know, it's a terrible map in the sense that 
uh, it's very hard to pluck any value off of it, right? Like how fast is this arrow moving, right? Like it's not something that we are, we are good at doing at all, but as an impressionistic map, uh, it's successful in the sense of like gives you a sense of shift in a way that uh, you might not otherwise get. Sure, I can use this. I can my favorite part about that map, though, is that actually uh, Mike Bostock, who did a lot of the development, is that he, you know, the classic problem with all of these maps is that area is not proportional to population. And so he played this clever trick, I thought, was that he didn't show all the arrows all the time on the map. He sampled them according to population, uh, which is a trick that wouldn't make sense in print, right? Like, why doesn't Montana show up on my map? It's like, well, we sampled a random number and you came up empty, right? Like that's kind of like dissatisfying in print. If you're in Montana, you're like, I paid $7 for this newspaper, right? Uh, but on the internet where you can also like, you know, you sampling over time. So if you just watch the map long enough, uh, you get Montana arrows, which I thought was a clever, I feel like there's ways on the internet that we could be exploiting randomness in our maps that are sort of untapped. So we have about 10 minutes left of, of the panel, and then we'll have questions. And I want to talk about some trends that are happening, and, and who better to talk about that than Andre and Amanda as well. So where are we? What are the big changes in this realm? What are the challenges that are happening in the, at the Times newsroom? Uh, how do you guys uh, see this landscape shifting? I, I mentioned medium, um, more and more traffic. Just when we were in, our, in paradise as cartographers with these big, colorful displays, in the uh, mid-aughts, uh, the phones come, right? And now more and more traffic is, is on the iPhone or the Samsung or whatever, which is annoying for people who make graphics in the media. So how do you guys approach all of these challenges with blending media, storytelling, and all that? And what are the big changes we can expect going forward? So, so we were talking about this problem this morning as, the I think, the hardest thing for um, our jobs is figuring out how to suddenly make something like this work when you just have three inches of <laughs> screen real estate. Um, and I think it's really hard. I think it's not really something that anybody has solved yet. Yeah. Um, with this one, we kind of made a lot of compromises. I mean, there was a lot of technical work that had to go into just like optimizing it so it could run on this much lower speed processor, um, so on a much lower speed connection. So there's kind of these technical challenges to doing high fidelity data on mobile. Um, but then there's also the fact that like, if you scroll up here, you know, to, to go back to your point about kind of the exploration versus storytelling, on the desktop version, we kind of balance those by having this exploratory map, but giving people some scenarios with little stories that they could just click on. Yeah. Um, we couldn't figure out a way to get that to work on mobile. Just the interface was too hard to kind of squeeze in these little stories. So, so we kind of lost what was an important part of the desktop map on the phones. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's definitely like the biggest mm -hmm. challenge for us moving forward is how to do stuff as rich as these desktop experiences on these new devices. Yeah, Amanda, do you have, I'm sure you guys, it's a nightmare, right? It's like, how do I make this incredible project work on a 25 inch display and a two inch display as Andre is describing? How do you guys deal with that? Yeah, though I would argue, I think some of our map guys have, are better at this than that we are in other areas. You know, the thing about a map is it's space filling and the we've navigate, navigational maps have taught people the basic metaphors about like pinch to zoom or whatever. So I feel like the interesting challenges are or less about like how do I scale this and more about like how do we interpret what it means in an interesting way. You know, how do we surface that this is more than like uh, cities vote for Democrats and <laughs> county and rural areas. Well, you know, I, I, I feel like there's more, or maybe it's a lower hanging fruit, but uh, there's, you know, if you have three inches, you, you, can, you can do so much in three inches and yeah. you just recognize those limitations. Uh, I think. Often now when I go back to graphics that we we're making you know, a few years ago, uh, I actually enjoy the mobile version more because it forces right. us to be better editors. Uh, it forces mm -hmm. us to not try to go overboard in like, the number of things that we can do. But, so I think pushing on the why is part of the future. Uh, you know, I alluded to it with precinct results, you know, pushing on uh, what the actual data is and how fast we can, we can turn that around. Like, you know, it's insane that in a primary Congressional district results are not clean right now, uh, you know, in all states. Uh, that's and that's how delegates are awarded, right? Like that's crazy, right? Like so, I think it's like there's real like substantive data challenges that are uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean the the congruence principle of graphics has always been something I try to teach my students. And the Coraplith map is really nice because this district voted for this person, so we'll color it this way. 
but that's not really a great explanatory mechanism for some of the things you're talking about. Uh, you can drill down with other thematic map devices. The dot density maps are starting to show up where you can really see individual votes in some cases. And, and those maps, you guys have done some. I know 538's done a few. Um, how can we be better in 2016? It's the day after the election of Donald Trump, right? <laughs> and what, what does, what is your goal that day at 538 as the map graphics guy? <laughs> um, I don't know what the answer to that is at all. Uh, that map would be a great map. It's just a change map. Right? Yeah. Like, uh, so what, how do you guys, I guess, rephrasing that, how do you guys approach, that's a really big day for both of you, right? It's the, the Wednesday, right? And how do your organizations brainstorm and select what might run that day from a map perspective? I mean, I feel like we, me personally, we're going to be exhausted because we're going to, we're pouring all of our energy into these like live tricks about like where is the vote left, right? Like yeah. that's, the, that's our favorite new like sort of trick is uh, that the votes as they come in live are not, not what's counted. But I think, you know, the general principle for the day after is how do I, how do I explain what just happened? Uh, you know, there's probably interesting house maps which are challenging. Maybe there's maybe an interesting Senate map in that scenario. Uh, and so uh, the day after map is a why. It's pushing on a like, how do I explain, uh, you know, something I already know, something I learned on my phone last night, uh, which was who won. And the day after is always, uh, you know, how do I understand yeah. what was different from the last time? Yeah, I love that. You guys have done change really well. I think the audience is going to be wondering, like, did my neighbor vote for Trump? And uh, they're going to want to see a map of their neighborhood and just go, like, I'm so not friending them. I'm, I'm defriending them. But I, I mean, you can get down to that kind of level nowadays. But, yeah. um, but anyway, I, my, one of my issues with mapping, um, I, I feel like, you know, in the informed electorate thing about, you know, just an informed electorate, you know, actually makes some great decisions. But I feel like with all this wonderful technology, the dis disappearance of newspapers, there are those of us who are preaching to the choir this amazing technology. I, I live looking at this stuff. I love it, I love it, I love it. And I learn so much. But we're leaving behind, I feel like, 50%. You know, just we're heading off down into the sunset. But stalled back here are people who don't, who don't really connect to this kind of data and this kind of experience. They're actually scared of and intimidated by interactive experiences. They don't go seek them out. And you know, they have to go seek them out unless it comes across their Facebook page or something. So, my, my curiosity, and I think some, a challenge down the road is to how to, how to include and to embrace the, the probably a huge uh, percentage of Americans who are not in, engaged as we are with this kind of data and this kind of, they're not New York Times readers or, um, or 538 readers. So it's, it's just a curiosity for me because I've always, my audience has always been the small guys, the, the little papers in, in Helena, Montana and those folks and, and uh, I'm just still, I feel like they're being left behind. They're not, so they're no longer being informed, which means they can be more easily manipulated. And uh, so I'm just wondering how we can somehow, uh, and I think it all comes down to storytelling. Um, here, here, roll over these things. Here, you see a lot of maps that just, just show a map and you're supposed to understand how to use it. You roll over things, a bunch of data comes up, which means nothing to these folks. So it's all about storytelling, I feel, and it's somehow somehow a way to find to, to make these stories relevant to these people and, and in, engage, engage them and inform them in, uh, in a way that is, is speaking their language. And I'm not sure what that is. Um, maps are beautiful, maps are wonderful, but, um, but they're, no longer, they're no longer experiencing them randomly and they're, when their 25 cent newspaper hits their front step. They're, there's all this stuff that they're just experiencing. They have to go seek it out. Um, and I don't think that's happening, so I, I feel like they're left in the dust. Carl is the world's oldest millennial. I wanted to use that earlier, but you, you really are. <laughs> you are addicted to technology more than most of my undergraduate students. But uh, yeah, you dropped your phone. I I want to, uh, <laughs> and I own it. He's always concerned about phones. So, <laughs> who has questions? I we left five to ten minutes for questions about math. So yeah, we'll start with you. There's a microphone coming. Thank you guys for a really wonderful presentation. It was really terrific. Carl and Amanda, you both brought up an interesting point to me, and that is editing and the importance of identifying stories. Where do you see stories not being identified now in the process? Is that in the creation of the graphic? Is that with editors, reporters, or others? 
Do you want to go? Well, you know, I think that um, w w as editors and reporters, we make a lot of assumptions about our, our readers. And certainly we know our audiences at Newsweek, and certainly the New York Times elevates their readers, but we make a lot of assumptions that they know things. So the storytelling right away is, you, you, you'll see a bar chart that basically just says, you figure it out. You read the data, you figure it out. Where, whereas just a little paragraph of context and what this really means is, is, is obvious, but it's often missing. Um, so I feel like right off the bat, there's just an assumption made that our, 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 readerships will, our readers will be able to understand these things. So I believe that, um, that the, 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 just, just helping people understand what the context is, for what, why we're showing you this, that story, um, uh, beginning, middle, and end, good, bad, and the ugly, cause and effect, whatever it is, whatever the storyline is, showing that is important when we're even, especially when we're doing it with graphics. Graphics are visual, but they still can raise more confusion than they do clarity. So, Mr. Silver. You, yeah, I don't know if Amanda wanted to respond to that. Or. <clears throat> so we'll go to Professor Silver I have here. A question related to the um, the drilling down on these maps. Um, do, are you able to track, or have you tracked, how many people are doing it? You know, checking out Austin's uh, detail. I mean, you you go to a in the ca that case, probably the data it just comes to you in a very refined way. But um, you go to a lot of trouble to make that available, and I'm just wondering, wondering whether that's uh, cost efficient. You know, and I, I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the sad things about publishing things on the internet is that if you just look at how many people come to a thing and don't do anything, and whether that's a story they don't scroll down past the first paragraph or an interactive map. There's, there's a huge number of people who are just clicking on things and not even touching it. But once you get rid of those people um, in your <laughs> calculations, um, maps, we do track how people interact with our projects. And um, maps tend to be pretty high in terms of not just the number of interactions that people have, but also in terms of time on page. So if we look at how much time people are spending with these things, um, for many of these projects, the averages end up being in you know this three, four, five minute uh, range, and I think that tells us that people are kind of like taking advantage of the some of the depth that we're um, providing with with the interaction. Yeah, in the back. Thank you uh, for this great panel. I had a question about uh, this recent Arizona uh, primary uh, and the controversy surrounding that. If I understand it correctly, um, the election commissioner in Maricopa County uh, decreased the amount of precinct locations by 70 percent, uh, figuring that there'd be more mail-in balloting. If you were to be tasked by that county uh, to totally redo every polling location using map data uh, to properly uh, make voting as accessible uh, to people as possible or in any part of the country, how would you go about doing that? That's a really great question, right? Like, so you, you need some model about uh, where are the people going to vote in person, where do they live, and then you try to optimize, and what time of day are they going to vote, right? And then try to, I, I assume, uh, not having any expertise in this at all, it's a cool question, but you, I assume you try to like make it as equal as possible if you're trying to be do that in a fair way. I say get rid of polling. Play. Everybody vote on the web, you know, on the phones. Microsoft. Microsoft pulse. Surge. Pulse, Microsoft I mean, pulse. you know. Uh, Anthony, surge with pulse. the microphone is coming for you for CBS News. What fields outside politics inspire you the most? Where, where are people making great charts and great maps that you think you would want to go next and bring them into the world? That's a great question. Do you have So, I mean, 538. Um, is maybe mostly known for politics, but we do a lot of sports and we do a lot of mapping around sports. Uh, Kirk, when he was a contributor, did some great uh, maps kind of at the intersection of um, sports and culture, where he was looking at what uh, sports games were available in different areas and trying to understand the kind of geography of fandom around that. Um, our economics writers um, do a lot of graphics also. Um, that's kind of like a natural fit just because it's a subject that has a lot of geographic data. I think that's often the constraint is like what subjects that we cover have geographic data available beyond just like state by state. 
you know, I would add, you know, the, the foreign coverage is probably the natural home for the, for the New York Times uh, and maps. And uh, often the data is not uh, super substantive, but the place, I think it's a good reminder about how geography matters, right? Like I'm always attracted to maps where the geography, like the river means something or the mountain means something. I think that uh, has a space of, of interesting, I think, you know, in the context of like, where are you going to locate polling locations? Like that's a place that like actual geography actually matters probably. Too. No, I have one thought about that too. Is the is the concept of audience? Your, um, you know, uh, I love watching Buzz, looking at Buzzfeed and seeing what the young young people are putting out there. And, um, you know, we think of maps as static or interactive, but they're also animated. And uh, I've seen some really crazy animations done with maps where, clearly done by a 19 year old kid or somebody very young who knows their audience and is is sort of making these for younger younger audience. And they're they're very they're very engaging and. Uh, so I, I find myself uh, being more influenced by sort of the fringe folks that are doing these crazy things than, than the mainstream. Um, don't know how those would be adapted yet, but I, I find them really fun. And I think that's just great engagement and storytelling, and there's, there, there are ways to connect with different audiences. There's not one size fits all for everything. It's, it, you, they could be tailored to different audiences, I feel. Yeah, and just building on one of these early points, and, and Andre's Facebook primary, uh, there's incredible data sets in 2016 out there, but a lot of them are behind locked doors in Google, in Facebook, in Microsoft. And occasionally we get to peek into them uh, and see the spatial structure of things like which football team is most popular in Travis County. Uh, it's the Cowboys, but, you know. <laughs> but the, there's this incredible thing going on where Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat is harvesting all of this data about the American population and the global population. Unfortunately, they don't share that information, either for good reasons or for bad reasons, whatever. That's what I want to see more of, to answer Anthony's question. With that's, we, when we see tiny little glimpses into that potential, I get really excited, but I also get frustrated that we can't see more of it. Uh, yeah, us too. We yeah. you know, tried really hard to get Facebook to share all kinds of other stuff that we thought would be even more interesting, stuff about what ads people are seeing in different areas from the online campaigns, about how people are interacting. Um, and they, um, they have a lot of concerns about sharing the data, both in terms of protecting their users' privacy, but also, I think, just to protect their business interests. And that's yeah, frustrating and, and to And they've too. done even some incredible mapping projects on their own. Uh, I don't know who, I don't know the data science team there. But yeah, there's really good reasons why they're not sharing that, let me be clear. But uh, I wish we could have meet halfway somewhere uh, more often. Um, next question right here. Could you guys talk? Could you guys talk about the, the population distribution problem, right? So people make these alternative maps that equate uh, the population to to prevent the overrepresentation of low density areas, right? And obviously we're all familiar with these and have seen these alternative maps, but they're rarely used. And I've seen arguments that, in fact, the ubiquity of these standard maps really systematically underrepresents, for instance, racial minorities who are heavily concentrated in dense urban areas. And I guess I wonder, are any of these alternative formats something you've explored? Are they just too hard for people to interpret and work with? And how do you address this issue? So uh, Josh Tober from GovTrack wrote a big critique about some of the maps we did at 538 along those lines. Um, and was basically making the argument that you should only use cartograms that are you know, corrected for population. Um, and you know, I think that sort of underestimates the audience in terms of, I think, our readers understand that there's a lot more people in New York than Montana. I think it also underestimates the importance of like familiarity. Like, You can look at a 50 state map or a map of the state you live in or a map of your hometown and immediately know like, what the different areas are and, and kind of what the things mean. When you do these complicated cartograms, I think there's a place for that. We use them a lot on 538 too. We did recently for some uh, delegate maps where we were sizing states according to the number of delegates they had. But I think that um, geographic maps, um, in terms of how easy they are to use and how they work well as an interface for people to dive in, are just much more approachable than anything more complicated. Yeah, and just building on that is one of the things we try to do as cartographers is build a congruent depiction of whatever worldly phenomenon we're trying to map. and. Uh, 
America is now what we're trying to map. We're trying to map the electorate, and more specifically, a lot of times, the Electoral College. Uh, and we've seen block, block cartograms appear in the New York Times for years, uh, other people, 538. It is, in my opinion, a more sort of congruent depiction of the chessboard that is the Electoral College. Um, that said, it warps this basic relationship the average viewer has with the geography of the United States of America. And it's not so easy to identify North and South Dakota when they're two grid squares somewhere where we're not really expecting them. So it's a give and take. I mean, it, you're going to continue to see both of them. And in my opinion, you're going to continue to see more traditional corporate maps of states and political districts simply because the readers are more comfortable with that familiar depiction of geography um, that underpins the whole story. Um, Another component to that is the, uh, you know, that Newsweek map I showed was just red, and it, you know, it's very distorted, it's very distracting. A lot of people who don't quite understand what that, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, I think you're right, they, they know their population and they know New York's bigger than Montana. But the, uh, but the free stuff, there's a lot of free stuff out there for generating maps now, data-driven maps, uh, uh, a lot of great stuff that, that, uh, that you can do. But I don't, unless anybody knows, I have not been able to find one that generates cartograms. Um, I can generate a lot of G GIS mater material in, in free software, but um, like you know, like, like Tableau Public, but but I'm not able to find anything that generates a, well, a it's, cartogram. It's not trivial to maintain the sort of topology and warp the sizes of these geographic districts. That's true. Uh, That's true. It's difficult. The only time I've ever built one is by hand. I, I saw think, that. It or was, GIS. Yeah, it was awesome. Uh, it's a hard time doing. It seems it so too. easy to just you know relate that to population. Yeah, I mean, and then generate this thing. And that's a good point. It's, but the fact that nobody's made one, the fact that nobody's made one, is kind of indicative of the fact that we're getting more comfortable with it, just a general population map, you know, that we see. It is, yeah. Like I said, it's the mascot of political analytics is the red state, blue state map. We're all and so entrenched with it. Uh, there was a question here in the middle. Can we get a microphone to this? Uh, had to sit Could not middle. be sitting in a worse place. Wow. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Uh, this has been really interesting. I was a geography major in undergrad and was trained on ArcGIS like every uh, probably geography major across the country. And so you were kind of just discussing it. But what are the tools now that are in the toolbox for people who are doing this in the media or people who are, people doing this just analytics for campaigns or trying to really understand how to map data at this point? Is, ArcGIS is still the standard. You mentioned Tableau. Uh, what are the ways that people should be approaching this work in 2016? Thank you. Um, so at, at 538, we use um, a lot of different tools. Um, we use QGIS. We, use, we do a lot of stuff in R um, for actually building the visualizations. And once in a while for analysis, we're using D3, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS um, for, for the presentation. Um, and then we use a lot of just general purpose programming. So a, a lot of times, the, the things you'll see kind of go through many steps of processing where some elements might be in R, others in Python, others um, going through geographic systems and like some of the open source uh, GIS command line stuff. One, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, man. I'd love to. I was going to say one of the one of the softwares I've used is uh, uh, I like Adobe Illustrator, and um, so I. I, I, there's a plugin for Adobe Illustrator. For, it's not, it's not for this level of, of, of well, it's pretty good. It's um it's a, it's called um, Map Publisher, and it's it's a plugin for Adobe Illustrator. So when you merge them, all of a sudden your Adobe Illustrator has a, a Maps tab that it didn't have before, and it mm -hmm. and it become, puts up a spreadsheet, and you can import data into it, and it generates a map. And what's nice about that is it stays linked to the design as opposed to as opposed to Esri products, where you you have to sever the link to the to the data to, to, to then go make it pretty in Adobe Illustrator. You can um, it stays con continually linked to the data. So if you update something in the spreadsheet in Illustrator, it updates it on the on the map itself, which is great for base maps and that sort of thing. I'm curious to hear what what you all are using at the time. Yeah, I think it's very similar to Andre's answer. Uh, almost all of our Data you type maps uh, are New York Times code on top of D3 uh, is, is our sort of software package. Can you explain to the people what D3 is? Oh, so so D3, it sounds like yeah, C3PO. Oh, sure. uh, <laughs> D3 is a JavaScript library uh, written by a guy named uh, Mike Bostock, uh, and it's a way essentially to bind data to uh, elements on a web page, right? And so to say, like, 
I am a square or a county shape and I have this property. Uh, you could do it better than I can. There are a lot of, there are a lot of template, templated visualizations that you can select from there, right? That I mean, part of the, you know, D3 does not have the world's easiest learning curve, but part of why it has been successful in the world is because Mike sold it, or, you know, he invested a lot of time and energy developing examples uh, when he was trying to get people, you know, a D3 is basically for high-end visualization in the media, at least, is basically the standard uh, across all of your... Uh, major new sites, uh, so it's you know it's JavaScript code. Uh, it's not plug and play like a like a Tableau or something. But uh, the trade off of that is you have all the control that you want. Uh, so we are people who like control. Um. We have time for one more question, and uh, Shannon, if you can get this guy a microphone, um, I think it is interesting that Mike Bostock, who sort of created the industry standard that we're referencing here right now poetically ends up working at the Times in this division for at least a stint, right? He was there for so a couple of years. I think that tells yeah. you how. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Do you guys know how um, campaigns are reacting to these maps? Do you know if people are using these maps internally or if they're rejecting some of, you know, maybe the your theses that go along with the logic and building these maps? Or, I don't know, they're seeing social spikes in counties. They wouldn't expect them and all of a sudden are devoting more resources. That's a good question. I'd be curious if uh, anyone who well, I actually like I asked a couple of small small town politicians I know on Facebook. I, I asked them. They're one of them is the well, they're they're Michigan people, and they I asked them if they use maps, how they use this data, and uh, it's really to 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 canvas an area really there. So they're generating their own maps uh, for knowing which doors to knock on and which ones not to knock on, um, and uh, which which is. Uh, I I I I don't I think very few small politic you know single guy you know people running for an office I think if you have a campaign staff they're probably doing that for you but but uh, he said he's using it to uh, but but most of them aren't really going to the point where they're visualizing this stuff but some of them do um, certainly on the broader scale the, the map of the city with the neighborhoods but house by house it's still pretty much. Uh, they stick with the spreadsheets. They're not. It's, not, it's still not really easy to do this stuff. As you're, well, it's like it's like sports teams. Some are really good with analytics, and some are terrible. Uh, I think that the, that the analogy holds with political campaigns. I imagine, you know, the Obama campaign was famous for doing things that nobody had done previous. Um, in a presidential campaign, we're going to continue to see people that leverage this stuff, whether it's maps, modeling, etc. Uh, just like the Times and 538 are ahead of the curve in journalism, there's going to be campaigns. But how about those candidates, those candidates who saw Amanda's map of, of New York just blew their minds <laughs> when they saw where their support was and wasn't. Yeah. That was really an, an eye-opener for them. You know? uh, well, listen, guys. We've made it through this mapping session, uh, which promises to be the most cartographic session of the day. I promise it. <laughs> I'd like to thank the panelists one more time. We'll take 15 minutes. <laughs>